The uh, color of that insulator looks really good. Uh, it shows that this 447 is running pretty good. You want to have it a nice, oh, kind of a tan or a chocolate brown color like that. You just look at the insulator in there. Uh, that tells you how the thing's running. There's a little bit of a soot around the shell here, uh, which probably come from idling to go back to the hangar. Uh, but basically, as far as looking at the temperature, the way that plug's running, everything looks like the mixture's right and the plug temperature's correct. Uh, and of course, we're using the, the fine wire uh, plug there. So I think it's, I think this thing's really running very nicely. I thought I'd make a little video here of uh, just how you go about getting in and out of this thing, which is probably the first thing you have to teach somebody if they're going to fly this thing. The tail goes down on the stabilator. That's the way it sits when there's nobody in it because the pilot's weight is the ballast in the nose. So it has to have somebody in it to have the tricycle gear work. So to get in it, I usually push the stick forward and I, I sit on the edge of this fuselage like so. Just put your weight on it real gentle and it'll go down like that. And you can get in the seat like so. Then to start the engine, you're going to turn on the switch. You can close the door if you want to, although sometimes I leave it open and get a little air. It's kind of warm today. Switch is on. You don't want to pull this one. You want to pull this one. Make sure the throttle's off. Clear prop. go down real easy here. There's a little wheel back there for it, but uh, the other thing I do to keep the stabilator from uh, dragging uh, on the ground or so I can push it back in the hangar, I pull a stick back and put the seat belt here, just latch it together like that put it over that stick. That holds the stabilator up and keeps it from dragging on the ground. So there you can see how it's sitting when nobody's in it. Next thing I'll show you is if it's been sitting a long time, especially in a hot hangar, a lot of the fuel's going to uh, turn to vapor and you'll get air bubbles and stuff and actually if it was shut off warm probably the fuel that's in this carburetor bowl will kind of percolate out of there so to fill it it has one of these little squeeze bulbs on it it's what they use for an outboard motor you squeeze that and that will pressurize and pump fuel into the carburetor if this float bowl is empty uh, sometimes if it's set for a long time you might need to do that in order to get it to start when it's cold uh, cold starting you set the choke and uh, turn on the ignition and then you start it that's all there is to it there ain't much to it but you might want to pump this first uh, when you're doing a pre-flight you want to look at the cracks in the carburetor socket see if there's anything wrong with that you don't want the carburetor falling off uh, examine your hoses and just look for anything that looks like it's you know kind of out of place on there uh, or something that could be wrong with it and make sure you're your uh, fuel tank cap which right here is where I put fuel in it this is this goes to the fuel tank and anyways why this particular uh, device right here is is just a vent for the gearbox that allows air to vent out of the gearbox because there's a lot of oil in there splashing around 
and this is a way to vent it and let the air out. Okay, this is a, a view here of the choke. You push that down, that chokes the engine when you start it cold. It only works if the throttle lever is off, so you have to have the throttle level lever pulled back to an idle, and then it'll choke it, and that's how you start it. Always you start it with the throttle lever back. This is off when it's pulled back up like that. This is the switch that turns on the ignition. It's really just a kill switch. When that's up, the engine's hot. If you turn that prop, it might start up on you. Uh, this switch down here is for fuel transfer, which I can tell you about later. You just pull it out, and that'll cause a big red light to go on on the dash. All right. There's the throttle lever here. You can see that better. Always have that off when you start it. Once it starts up, you might want to accelerate it to about there, holding your feet on the brake so it don't move, because it rolls pretty easy. And if it's anything above an idle, it generally don't want to sit still. Uh, there are some uh, wooden wheel chocks here that you can pull in with this rope if you want to start it with chocks in front of the wheels. But uh, always start it with the throttle off like that. Other than that, the only other thing I got to tell you about is this here is the altimeter. That turns it on. That reads 1,240 feet right there. You can adjust it by turning this knob, like for instance, where we're at here is 1100, so we'll set it like that. This is battery one and battery two, and the center is off. There's two batteries in it, so if one went dead, you could flip the switch up and still read altitude. Uh, airspeed here, the VNE is 90. You don't want to go faster than 90 with this thing. This is an ultralight, this is an irregular Titan. And you do not, do not go 100 mile an hour with this thing, because it might blow the wings off. So you, your VNE is 90 on here. And uh, it has the uh, safe flying speed marked on there and so forth. With, even with the flaps down, you can slow it down to an indicated 20, but I don't think it's really going 20. It's just that the angle of attack is so, is so great with the flaps down like that that the air's not hitting the pitot tube right. I don't really think you're going 20 mile an hour. You're going pretty slow, but not that slow. This is the light that comes on when the fuel transfer's on. This would work if, if that switch under the seat's working, then this, this light will come on and glow red at you so you don't forget that you're transferring fuel and refueling. What you can do with this is refuel in flight is what it does. It only has a five gallon tank and used to stop and, and just pour gasoline in to refill, but you've got to find a place to land and sometimes it's not always safe to, a safe place to land. So needed a way to be able to refuel without having to do that. So any fuel that's left in the mixing tank, you can pump that in. Uh, this is your fuel gauge here, uh, your EGTs, and this is the tachometer here, and uh, of course your slip indicator here. But anyways, I'm sure that'll all be on this socket here, cigarette socket, so you can plug in a radio or a GPS or something and run it on 12 volts, or charge up your cell phone if you're using that for a GPS. Okay, these things right here are the heel brakes, which when you push on them, it just pulls this cable and puts on mechanical go-kart brakes. They work pretty well, these things. You push on with your heel. Your toe works the rudder by pushing up on the rudder bar up on the top. There's a, a top part to the pedal that you push on, and that's for steering. That's about all there is to the brakes and so forth. You'll notice there's another position if you're a short fella, you could move those pedals back. They're, they're almost too far forward for me, but it does have another position you could put it in. <clears throat> okay, now as far as the ballistic chute goes, this is the handle for the chute. You don't want to get it mixed up with the one you pull to start the engine. This has a pin in here supposed to have a remove before flight tag on it. It looks like a pin to a grenade or something, but I leave it in because if I ever wanted to use that chute, uh, I figure I can pull that pin out real easy. And I don't want somebody to pull this thing by accident. Uh, I've seen little kids go and pull them and shoot them off too. That's not good. So I just leave that pin in. I don't take it out, but anybody buys it can do what they want with it. 
This is a flap handle. You got flaps off here. You got this, which is usually where I land it and take off at. Although you can put full flaps down like that and land it that way. I wouldn't try taking off. That's quite a bit of drag. I don't, I don't know if it would take off with that. I haven't tried that yet. So that's all there is to that. Not much else to see from over there. Okay, uh, there you can see the fuel transfer tank. Uh, you'll want to be careful of the filler neck here. You'll notice it's pretty, pretty close to this rod that has to go up, move back and forth here, you see. Uh, it misses it, but you might want to think about getting one of those fillers that go straight down in. I might, I might change that. I don't know. Right now it doesn't seem like it's any problem, but uh, also you'll notice I got forward restraint here and this particular strap here holds it down. This is just a hose I made to help fill a tank when you have to go for a hike and get some gas. Does run on auto fuel. You can see the BRS chute in there. Uh, the date on it I don't know but you can go through the cargo door to get to this stuff. Also you'll notice here on the on the uh, center for the uh, gas gauge, there's a little tiny Phillips head screw here and here. One says for full and one's for empty. You turn those screws to adjust when the gauge reads full and when it reads empty. And I've got it set now so I think it'll read empty when there's about only a gallon of fuel left in it. But I think I'd like to test that a little bit just to make sure. Uh, if, if you do want to refuel in flight, you you can pump it from this tank into this tank, or you can land someplace, take this loose, take this whole can out, and then dump it in. Uh, the tank is vented. The vent comes out underneath the plane. That's what this is, so you don't get any gas fumes in here, because uh, carrying an extra you know, gas can inside the plane could give you some gas fumes. I mean, this, this one's vented too, but they're both vented together, so they come out under the plane. And there you can see the BRS, which I have kind of put fabric over top of. It didn't have that, but it's never gotten wet. It's all just like brand new. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not as old as the airplane because I got my chute repacked in 1998, maybe, and that's when they changed it to put that kind of a of a uh, can on there, the big white can like that, and. When I when I took it apart to send it in, I found out, well, those things are like brand new inside. It looks like a tent inside of a metal thing. What they're worried about is water. If water gets in there, that's going to ruin the chute. And as long as they're hangered and everything, I don't think you have to worry about those chutes, although they'd like you to pay a 1000 bucks to get it repacked all the time. But I, I think that would be foolish if, you're, if your chute has really been inside that can and it's been dry all that time. Uh, other than that, you know, pre-flight would be the standard stuff you do on, on any aircraft, and uh, and you'll find that this one is uh, pretty easy. Everything you can get at and see pretty good. I'd say the only thing I'd want to look at real close uh, before I fly it all the time would be these bolts down here. This is a Jesus bolt. You don't want these things to come off because Jesus, if that came off, this whole stabilator would come off there. So. They've got a cotter pin in them and everything, so they're not likely to come off. But it might be something you can you can check it just by looking at it. You can see it easy just walking around the plane. So, anyways, that's about it. This time I came in and landed with full flaps and uh, actually came in pretty good. It's